Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good evening to all. Good evening. Yeah. So just we started about the session. Myself, Riddhi Gohel, moderator of this session. On behalf of Global Knowledge Research Foundation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the seventh international conference on information and communication technology for competitive strategy through Zoom. I hope you will enjoy the knowledgeable and interactive session throughout the day. In this session, we have eight presentation and each presenter will be given eight minutes for the question answer, and the two minutes for the, uh, sorry, eight minutes for the presentation and two minutes for the question answer. On seven minutes, I will raise a general reminder. So please kindly request to stick to the time limit. There is another request to all, uh, please stay connected with us until the closing remark. If you have any query and update, let me know in the chat box. Just before we get started, I would like to invite it. I would like to invite, uh, introduce to all our chair of this session, Professor Samiksha Shukla. Professor Shukla is an associate professor at Christ Bangalore. Her research interests include computational security, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, and big data. Her core expertise in computational security, artificial intelligence, and healthcare related projects. She has presented and published several research papers in the reputed journals and the conference, has 16 years of explained academic and research experience. She is a reviewer also for the Inder Science General, Spinger Nature, International Journal of System, Assurance, Engineering and Management, and IEEE, and also SEM conferences. So we welcome you, ma'am, in our session. So thank you, Riddhi. So let's start our the first. Uh, I would like to invite our first presenter, Renu Jado. And the paper title is Analysis of Sensor Used in the Medical Body Area Networks for Alzheimer's Patients. Hello. Yes, uh, this is actually Sakhi Chaudhary. Uh, so I'll be presenting. So will that work? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, just a second to share the screen. The brain cells to strain. So it's a dementia uh, which majorly happens in elderly people above age of 60 and above. It, uh, it, uh, in, in this process, uh, they actually, uh, it causes a decline in their thinking, memory, and it also affects their behavioral and social skills. So it is estimated that more than 6 million people are living with Alzheimer's and by 2050, it will be projected to 13 million. <clears throat> so, uh, the paper of uh, ours uh, uh, specifies the various tasks and objectives along with the hardware and software requirements for the project titled Analysis of Sensors Used in Medical Body Area Networks for the Alzheimer's Patients. So, uh, the main purpose of our project uh, is uh, developing a search and healthcare monitoring systems for these patients for various objectives. And this can be only achieved by integrating few sensors and which, uh, which will help us to form a complex system that will help in the, mo uh, the monitoring of the movement and tracking of location of Alzheimer's patients. So the basic uh, flow diagram, uh, that is the structural design for uh, stru yeah, structural design uh, what we started was that first the main three components will be a sensor, the processor, and the output. So, uh, for the the sensor or the input part is where we'll be uh, taking the input from the patient. Uh, for example, we are having an accelerometer or gyroscope, which will which can detect the uh, acceleration or uh, uh, if they fall, then we can record that. That will be the input. Then we'll process the signals, which is which is done through the node MCO, and the output will be given 
uh, an alert will be sent to the required person. So there are uh, various factors which we need to consider by selecting the sensors, processor, and the output device. So one of the factors which we found out was the scalability. So uh, in the scalability, we need to see that the sensors and the algorithms uh, which are being used uh, by the sensor needs to be uh, large in size. Like they should be able to uh, scale a large amount of data into them. And uh, that should be one of the main factors which I, we felt. The next was the production cost. As we are making something which is very required in the society, we need to see that for every sensor, we reduce the cost uh, and uh, and the cost needs to be justified for every sensor which we'll be using. The third point we thought was the hardware constraints. So uh, like in a hardware, we have a sensing unit, a processing unit, a, trans a transceiver unit and a power unit. So uh, this components, a uh, few more components can be added to the sensor according to the requirement of the application. So, uh, but we need to see that the components are very small in size, as small as it needs to be fit into a small uh, centimeter or in, in within a few meters, as this, uh, this smart complex system will be on our body. So th this was the three factors which we thought for the design then uh, as starting with uh, first uh, we are taking the MPU 6050 so the basic technology is it consists of a three axis accelerometer and a three axis gyroscope so the measurement of acceleration velocity orientation displacement and other motion related parameters of a system or an object can be done by the MPU 6050. MPU 6050 is smallest device which consists of integration of gyroscope and accelerometer on chip. It is very easy. Uh, it can be easily embedded into the uh, small scale production and applications. Uh, along with the three axis uh, gyroscope and accelerometer, it also has a temperature sensor. This device has a high accuracy and has a low power consumption. Here, uh, the working is such that the module can be interfaced using the onboard ADO pin. Uh, the full scale ranges of this is from 2G, 4G, 8G and 16G, but G is mentioned as gravitation. In the MPU, the movement along the X, Y, Z is being sampled by three 16-bit analog to digital converters and the digital value can can be uh, programmed to the various sensitivity so one of the uh, best uh, uh, one of the main use we can use this sensor as an uh, fall detection sensor for uh, a fall for for the fall if someone falls majorly it happens in the elderly cases so this can be used there the next one is the passive infrared uh, mm. PIR sensor. Sorry, uh, sorry, ma'am, for the interruption, but uh, yes, you have only one, one minute left, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So next is the PIR sensor, which we found. The motion detection uh, here, uh, they it uses a three-pin pyroelectric sensor, and the main usage is that uh, it uses thermal imaging and infrared imaging uh, for body detection in the system. Next is the RFID. Here, uh, the main is uh, we are using tags and we have the tag readers. So this can be used for the patient tracking, which is inside a room, or if he crosses a room or so, this tags can be used uh, for it. Next, the healthcare system uh, and few more examples. One, as I mentioned, the location tracking. Here, as the patients, they tend to or wander or get confused. So uh, the main very important is the location tracking uh, of these patients. The second is the fall detection. As it happens in elderly, 
fall uh, is very frequent to happen. So a tool which can be set which detects the fall and sends the alert immediately. Third is the psychologically comforting devices. Uh, usually patients, Alzheimer patients, uh, they become agitated, anxious. So something automatically, a uh, few uh, aromatic diffusers or soothing music, music players can be on uh, according to the patient. This is the third idea. So the conclusion of our research uh, paper was uh, the MP6050, we felt it's a portable device and a battery powered system. With the MPU 6050, a portable mobile phone can be updated to a powerful 3D intelligent device. And is um, the next, the PID, passive infrared detector, is frequently used to describe passive infrared sensors. They are referred to as passive since they do not release energy to be detected. The radiation emitted by the object is used for the detection. And the third is the RFID. RFID in uh, this previous and in near future, we'll see a huge demand in the RFID. Uh, there are many other high frequency RFIDs, low frequency RFIDs, which can be used for the detection of, uh, for the location detection of a patient. This were the few references which we used. And yes, thank you. Thank you, Saki, for the nice presentation. So, um, any question from the audience and our session chair? Okay. Thank you so much. There is a nice presentation on the analysis of sensors. There is a use in body, medical body area. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So our next presenter is Terina Sultana, and she's a going paper title is Automatic Recognition and Categorization of Tomato Leaf Syndrome of Disease Using Deep Learning Algorithms. Uh, yes, I'm present. My name is Arian Sultana. Let yes, me... I'm going to start your presentation. Yes. Is the presentation slide visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay, thank you. As the time is very limited, I'm going to start my presentation without any delay. Okay. Good evening to everyone present here. It's my honor to introduce to all of you about the, our paper, which is Automatic Recognition and Categorization of Tomato Leaf Syndrome for Disease Using Deep Learning Algorithms. The presentation of the paper is uh, presented by me, Aryan Sultana, and the paper ID is 66. The motiva motivation of the paper working on this is, leaf disease is a common problem in cultivation of crops and vegetables, and the detection of the disease by hand requires a large number of experts continuous observation, time, money, and effort. But if we can implement image processing techniques, then it will be easier for the detection of diseases. By identifying illness in leaves as soon as feasible, crop productivity is increased. disease effective plants may be found early on via image processing techniques. Here is a short outline of my presentation. First, I am going to talk about background methodology, which is data preparation and model description, result, summary, and reference. Uh, methodology, which is about data preparation, 14,005 to 29 images are of tomato leaves, <coughs> which are categorized into 10 classes. Nine classes are unhealthy, and one class is healthy. Each of the images downloaded in RGB form and is stored in JPG format. As you can see here is a chart of the diseases like fungi, bacteria, mold, virus, and mite. And fungi are early blight, leaf mold, septoria leaf spot, target, target spot, etc. 
and bacteria are bacterial spot mold or lead bite. Methodology, which is about model description. Two pre-trained CNN models that we were initially trained to categorize tomato lift images. One of the pre-trained network is shallow, resident 50, and the other is deep insufficient P3. And transfer learning is something about which is application of knowledge gained from completing one task to help solve a different but related problem. Basic of the transfer learning is simple. Take a model trained on a large data set and transfer it knowledge to a smaller data set. Transfer learning is carried out using deep learning, which heavily relies on these pre-trained models. Deep learning techniques involve tweaking pre-trained models and utilizing them as feature extractors. Here we can see a figure with this pre-trained model architecture. CNN is one of the main categories to do image classification and image recognition in neural networks. In CNN, each input image will pass through a sequence of convolutional layers along with pooling fully connected layers, filters, which is known as kernels, after their softmax function is applied to classify an object. Three separate size filters in the most condensed form of an inception module, which is one by one, three by three, and five by five. Max pooling is used. The outputs are then concatenated and forwarded to the following layer. The CNN is set up so that all of its convolutions are performed at the same level, which causes the network to grow in the width, width, depth, depth. Here is an example, I mean figure, which is three separate size filters in an inception module. Now I'm going to talk about inception V3 architecture. Inception V3 architecture, basically major modifications done on the inception V3 model are factorization into smaller convolutions, spe special factorization into asymmetric convolutions, utility of auxiliary classifications, efficient grid size reduction. Which, what is convolution? The process of transforming an image by applying a kernel over each pixel and its local neighbors across the entire image. Pooling is the process used to reduce the dimension of the feature map there. Asymmetric convolutions via special factorization, the usefulness of auxiliary classifiers, effective reduction of grid size. Here is a figure of inception with the model outline. And because of shortage of time, I'm not going to describe the, all of the model outline. Resonant 50 architecture. Resonant 50 is a 50 layer resonant architecture, includes the following elements, a seven by seven kernel convolution, a max, a max pooling layer, nine more layers, 12 more layers with one by 1,128 kernels. Resonant 50 is a variant of resonant model, which has 48 convolution layers, along with one max pool and one average pool layer. Resonant 50 model consists of five stages, each with a convolution and identity block. Each convolution block has three convolution layers, and each identity block also has convolution layers. The Resonant 50 has over 23 million trainable parameters. 18 more layers with one by 1,256 cores, and two cores three by 3,256, and one by 1,000. 1024 iterated to six times. And there are nine more layers with one by 1,512 cores. And up to this point, the network has 50 layers. Resident 50 performed better than the inception VC model in our research work, which is Tommy to leave images for the 10 classes challenges. The accuracy of ResNet 50 is 96%, which is around 8% higher than the inception P3. In addition, in the case of precision recall and effort score, the ResNet 50 is better than the inception P3 model. Here is an example, I mean, result 
of the model accuracy, which is 87.98% uh, for inception B3 and 95.62% for ResNet 50. And as you can see, precision recall and F1 score is, according to the inception B3, is 91%, 89%, and 87%. And for ResNet 50, it is 97%, 94%, and 93%. So the summary of the research work is machine learning and image processing technologies require a minimum number of unhealthy image samples and a deep learning model for identifying and categorizing the diseases, diseases on tomato plants. And in our research work, Resident 50 model performed better than Inception P3. Our long-term goal is to increase the gathering of distinctive data and gather a significant amount of information on various plant diseases. In the future, we will use new technology to increase accuracy. So here are some references that have been, have been used for my for our research work, and thank you. And at last, I am apologize for my voices as I have been caught cold. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, ma'am for the nice presentation. And there is a really nice research work done by you. So any question from the audience side and the, anyone? Yes, okay. I have a question. I yes, have... yes, please, please sir. Yes, uh, so my question is, what is the nobility of this research? Can you repeat the question again? Yeah, my question is, what is the contribution of this research or, or the nobility of your research? Okay, uh, as I have, I have been shown references of different works working on it, our research work has very high accuracy than the others. And I think it will lead to a conclusion that it will help in making a device or something like this type of app to detect more correctly the unhealthy disease, I mean, tomato leaf diseases affected leaves. Uh, the, uh, how did you increase the accuracy or the performance you had mentioned? Uh, yes. Mm, for this, I have to present the slide again. As I have discussed here about the methodology, batch size, learning rate, epoch loss function, and optimizer, uh, here you can, you can look at the values that we have been used. And for this reason, we have gained a large accuracy for this research work. So, uh, can you can you see my slide? I think so, it is not visible. Yeah, this is not visible. We have okay, said. I'm going to. Yeah, yeah you, you don't need to show the slide. I just would like to know that. How did you increase the accuracy? You have said that just increasing the batch size, you have increased the accuracy, right? Yes. Okay. Learning rate, epochs, loss function, optimizer, and the other authors who have been working, who have been worked on this, they have used different learning rate, epochs, loss function, and optimizer, and we have to uh, go through several values for this batch size, learning rate, epochs, loss function, and also the architecture of the models have have to uh, improve for this type of work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we are moving forward to our next presenter, Mahmoud Al Islam. And the paper title is Banking Software Services, Current Status, Challenges, Impact, and Prospects. Yes, uh, I'm presenting. So can you see my screen? 
Yes. Okay, so this is a, a review paper on the banking software services in Bangladesh. So uh, the paper title is Banking Software Services and Current Status, Challenges, Impact and Prospects. So the objective of this research, so the objective of this research was to investigate what is the current status and we know there are so many changes due to the COVID. And so also we try to know the challenges as well as impact and prospects of banking software used by Bangladeshi uh, banks. So uh, the methodology we have followed here that we have collected whenever we are talking about methodology, first the things comes to the data sources so we have gathered data from different sources, like we have interviewed the bank officials and their and their documents, and also we have uh, face to we had face to face conversation with the software uh, divisions people of banks and also their reports and other documents. Though it wasn't easy to reach or easy to uh, have the access on those documents, but we fortunately got that. And also we have collected data from the website of different software companies. So data we have collected uh, through questionnaires definitely for both customers and employer side. And, and uh, it was uh, open-ended questions. Therefore it is qualitative method, no quantitative method because we, we wanted to know the in detail. Therefore it was, uh, we have followed the qualitative method. So data analysis method, while uh, after collecting the data, uh, we just uh, kept the valid data. We have cross-matched uh, We have uh, cross matched the data from both sides, like that uh, we have collected data from the bank and also collected data from the software companies and then cross match. So we have kept only the valid data. So moving to the next slide. So now the question is, what are the local software companies and solutions? So uh, we actually able to reach four software companies in Bangladesh. Uh, they are known as Flora System, Millennium Information, Leadsoft, and Era Infotech. These are the uh, major software companies of uh, Bangladesh who provide banking solutions. And their banking solutions are Flora Bank, core banking system, Ababil, Bank Ultimus, and Iestela. So all those things are core banking system or CBS. Those solutions are developed for providing the bank uh, core banking system. They, these are known as core banking system, all those four solutions. So uh, the features of the solution, like you can see here that in the left side, this is the features uh, uh, there are four, uh, we can see here four, uh, uh, four figures here. So these are the features of those four software, like uh, in the left, uh, left top, we can see here that there are some features like the CBS can uh, provide the treasury information, loans and advance limit and exposure, other things. And, and uh, we can see here that also general ledger, customer information system, hierarchical sanction, Islamic deposit, all those things have been incorporated in the CBS. So these are the features of those four softwares uh, that I had mentioned in the earlier slide. So these are the clients of the local software. You can see here that so many banks are have been, uh, so many banks are borrowing the software from the local software company. So there is a huge uh, opportunity in this sector so you can see that Flora system uh, is uh, provide Flora system provides the solution to those banks like Trust Bank and we can see here that eight banks have uh, have borrowed their CBS software which is known as core banking software from the Flora system limited and also the leads provide uh, almost nine banks and Millennium provides the five banks and Ida Infotech also provides their CBS solution to the nine banks. I'm not spelling out or saying all those names of the banks because you can see here that those names are the banks. So moving to the next slide. So there are some problems in the local banks like whenever you, 
you try to uh, change the software system or the core banking solution, there are so many problems like that. The data, uh, the, one of the major problem is the data migration. So, and also the, uh, whenever uh, we incorporate the local CBS, this is easier for the local banks to integrate their product with the local software. But whenever it is borrowed from the foreign, foreign CBS, this is difficult. But it's still companies or, or banks are preferring the foreign CBS. So this is one of the problem. And other problems is that the bank officials are not uh, eager or not. They're reluctant, reluctant kind of uh, that. They don't want to change the current CBS. So there is a lack of uh, technical knowledge or the eagerness to change uh, to the newness. So these are the problems. And also the another problem is that the bank face problem when the, uh, when the banks fall victim to phishing attacks. So changing software is not easy. There are so many issues like at, uh, phishing attacks and security attacks, other things. So the challenges uh, of the challenges of implementation new solutions so the challenges uh, is like time and cost definitely whenever you are shifting to a new cbs that, that take so many time and also as well as you have to pay uh, a lot of money so this is a major issue and also the longer payoff periods stakeholder management all those things like adaptability issues because just not changing the software is not the solution because you should have that kind of manpower or the skilled people who can manage those software cbs so and also another thing is lack of trust because whenever they are changing the cbs uh, there is a huge portion of things that uh, the previous cbs is better than the current one this kind of a thing so lack of a trust is one of the major issue and definitely insufficient software quality or infrastructure from the uh, borrower side and here are some statistics like uh, centralized core banking system and market share of CBS. This is an interesting thing. Like we can see here in the left side that in uh, 2010, uh, 2010, there are almost 59% bank who used centralized core banking system, which is CBS. But in 2021, it was shifted to 88%. So you can see here that the banks are moving to the CBS. They have realized that they need CBS to do tomorrow to incorporate all those things, all this technology, and to provide the uh, better services to the customer. So in the right side, we can see here that market share of CBS with respect to the number of banks. And we can see here that uh, this is alarming that local CBS is losing their market share. We can see here that uh, before 2005, the local CBS uh, dominated, but in, in uh, 2011 to 2017, you can see here that local CBS is just decreasing. So this is alarming for the local software companies. They have to come up with the new solution, better solution. So moving to the next slide. So the distribution of CBS, we can see here. So sorry. sorry for the interruption, sir, but uh, you have only one minute left, sir. Okay, so uh, here, uh, the distribution of CBS, we can see here that uh, use of local software have been de decreased and also the distribution of CBS. We can see here that T24 CBS is dominating. So moving to the next slide, there are also the reasons uh, uh, we can see here that replacement of CBS and willingness to change of CBS. We can see here that most of the local to local CBS, which is 47.1%, the willingness to change the CBS. And they are listed the reasons behind replacing CBS. So the major reason is uh, transformation from old to new architecture and the legacy software, because we know that legacy software most of the time does not properly. properly. So th these are the reasons of the CBS. So limitation of this study was to gather the data and to extract the data from the bank as well as from the software company. So this was all from my side. Thank you. If there is any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. No, sorry. Uh, so, Islam, there is a very good analysis and uh, shows clearly perception of your mainly. Right? So, best of luck for the future work. So, we are moving forward to our next presenter.
Vimlesh Sharma. And the paper title is Biometric Inheritance Pattern Synthesis and Future Restriction. Patch. The paper title is Deep Learning Techniques for the Automatic Detection and the Classification of Rice Disease. Um, hello. Okay, I'll, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll start streaming. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raj Xavier, and I'm here to present on deep learning techniques for the automatic detection and classification of rice diseases. Uh, my paper ID is 67. It is authored by uh, me, uh, Bijan Paul, Aditi Roy, Siddharth Chakma, Abravitin Wara, Kanraki Mahmood, and Ashikur Rahman. Uh, this is what we will be discussing today. Uh, to, uh, for introduction, uh, rice is the primary food source for most people in Bangladesh, and it is instrumental in the economics of the nation as it contributes to 50% of the agricultural GDP and also affects over 48% of rural jobs. Economic results show that Bangladesh places importance on proper rice growing and the country must prioritize agricultural systems that can work without individual interaction. Now, the problem is that crop diseases prevent bountiful harvest, and it's usually caused by fungi, bacteria, and viruses. And these cost farmers of uh, a loss of 37% on average per year. Um, another problem is that the farmers lack the identification skills and knowledge to take preventive measures, so they instead choose to manage these diseases using pesticides and insecticides. These diseases cannot be avoided. So a quick and cost-effective contemporary system is crucial for diagnosis. The classic manual identification method is slow, unreliable, expensive, and is based on human experiences. And, uh, and it, by the time identification is done, it can be too late for, uh, to take preventative measures. Um, and it's const uh, and is uh, actively being left behind by the industry. Uh, while automated identification is frequently being adopted by most industries and it's fast, accurate, cost effective and based on exper uh, machine expertise. And it allows for immediate preventative measures to be taken once identification is done. And for this research, we have created a system using machine learning to automatically diagnose and categorize rice diseases from leaf images. And we hope this technology will aid in the development of this country's agriculture. A survey was carried out in Bangladesh, which found 20 rice diseases, of which 13 were identified as significant ones. And uh, for this research, we're uh, concentrating on three of these diseases because of how widespread they are in Bangladesh. These diseases are leaf blast, hispa, and brown spot. Now, leaf blast is caused by a fungus known as Magnoporth oryzae, and signs include diamond-shaped lesions. Uh, which later develop into brownish, uh, brownish rimmed ellipses with gray cores, which enlarges to destroy entire leaves. This results in yield losses if the plants are infected when they're young. Hispa, on the other hand, is a migratory insect species which migrates to distant fields. Affected crops exhibit extended lesions near leaf tips and edges. These leaves alter color from white to yellow and to gray due to infection. Hispa normally target young rice plants, but can infest adult plants during epidemics. Hispa is also common in southern districts, uh, districts where mild winters and favorable conditions allow the insects to persist all year. Uh, brown spot or septoria glycines is a fungus that causes round or oval, oval shaped brown spots. Uh, it materializes as irregular dark brown patches on upper and lower leaf surfaces. Stem and pod lesions have defined borders, black appearance, and, uh, and they vary in size. At the end of the growing season, infected leaves turn rusty brown or yellow and die off early. In this field of uh, plant disease diagnosis, academics have done extensive work to get more accurate results. And most methods are used today are based on infection categorization. As you can see, uh, these researchers have used algorithms like fuzzy, uh, SVM, ANN, CAFE frameworks, and also Canis edge detection, um, a random forest algorithm and histogram of oriented gradient for uh, detecting illnesses in wheat crops, rice, 
and uh, many other crops. For met uh, in our methodology, uh, we prepared the data set uh, by gathering images of both healthy and diseased leaves, uh, a total of um, 1,867 unhealthy and 1,488 healthy leaves were collected to make up the data set. Um, and we separated the data set into training, testing and validation in an 80 to 10 to 10 ratio, as you can see here. Uh, for pre-processing, uh, due to the size restriction on uh, the CNN models, uh, we, set, uh, we resized the input images to 224 into 224 for CNN and 244 into 244 for efficient net and inception V3. And uh, this is our model uh, configuration. Uh, we used batch size of 64, learning rate of 0 0.0001, 10 epochs, and uh, categorical cross entropy loss function and atom optimizer. and uh, the rectified linear unit activation function. Um, augmentations were applied on the existing data set because it's not enriched. And it also acts as a regularizer and helps in reducing overfitting. We have used six different augmentation techniques, uh, which include rotation, horizontal flip, width shifting, height shifting, shear range, and zoom. This is one of the architectures that we've used CNN. It's made up of seven, uh, several hidden layers, input layer and an output layer. The grayscale images are used in the input layer while the output layer creates the illness diagnosis and treatment options. Training data is given to the input layer. Convolution is applied on the samples and uh, the input is convolved using kernels to construct the output features maps. And pooling is then used to compress image uh, extraction features while the images are scanned. And the layers are stacked on top of each other until the images are minimized to a vector. And at the end, classification takes place in the fully connected layer. This is another architecture that we used, efficient net. Uh, we use this because it maximizes flops efficiently. It uses a mobile inverted bottleneck like MobileNet V2. Also uses MNOS net due to its bigger flop budget. It uniformly scales network depth width and resolution with a fixed scaling co coefficient. Uh, this is another one we use Inception V3. It's made up of multiple CNNs for, and 42 layers. These Inception models are used to reduce computational expenses. And also it is, the input is convolutional and is using three different size filters and max pooling. These are the functions that we've used, the rectified linear unit activation function, softmax activation function, and the loss function. The whole experiment was run on Google Colab and uh, below are the results for uh, comparison. CNN achieved an accuracy of 52.25%, Inception V3 54.73%, and Efficient Net, the best of them all, achieved a 72.52%, which is like 19% uh, and 21% higher than Inception V3 and CNN respectively. Uh, these are our accuracy graphs of training and validation accuracy of Inception V3, Efficient Net, and CNN. These accuracy rates are influenced by learning rate and the epoch value. Uh, this is the comparison of training and validation loss of Inception V3, Efficient Net, and CNN. As you can see, training loss was 0.5%, 0 0.6%, uh, and 1% for CNN, Efficient Net, and Inception V3, respectively. In conclusion, the study discussed this study discussed a deep learning model that identifies and categorizes rice diseases based on leaves. It also uh, considers the plant's external features like color, texture, and leaf edges. It also offers appropriate treatments which can increase paddy productivity. And data analysis revealed, uh, revealed that the efficient net model performed better than the CNN Inception V3 model. And this this system outperforms conventional manual methods in diagnosing uh, diagnosing plant diseases. Uh, we hope this approach can help farmers prevent paddy diseases like leaf blast, cysp, and brown spot from spreading further, saving time, money, and possibly resulting in more quality crops. Um, this is my references. Thank you. Thank you, Raj, for the nice presentation. And there's a really good analysis. And also experimental results are in detailed manner you explain.
Thank you. Yeah. Anyone question? Okay. So our next presenter is Azizul Hakim, and the paper title is IoT based real time air quality monitoring and the analytic system for patients with chronic respiratory disease. Yes, I'm present. Uh, let me present the screen first. Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to my presentation on the paper titled IoT based real time air quality monitoring and alerting system for patients with chronic respiratory disease. I am Mohammed Zul Hakim, connecting from Dhaka, Bangladesh. The co authors of this study are Hassan Sharir, Tashwat Fatima, Hassan Ahmed Dunia, Ali Ahmed, and Vijan Pal. We all are from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Department, University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. Uh, so, what are the motivation from our study? CRD is among the most deadly disease in the world. It caused death of 7% population in the year 2008 only. The statistics is very concerning in the other years too. Asthma is among the most deadly incurable CRDs and it affects 300 million population worldwide. If we consider only North America, 10% of its total population has asthma. It is claiming the leads of around 250,000 people around the world each year. So what are the objectives from the work? From our study, we found that asthma is an incurable disease. So taking precautionary steps to prevent the reaction of asthma to its minimum is the way to deal with this deadly disease. So we want to help asthmatics in taking precautionary steps. To do so, we need to measure the environmental risk also. And by doing so, we are basically developing an automated, an, an, an automated alerting system to reduce the loss due to CRDs. And now comes the methodology. Uh, so what is the way that we, we can follow to decide emergency environmental scenario? Here is a summarized flowchart of the overall decision-taking method. The first way is finding the presence of dust mites. If the average temperature exceeds 25 degrees Celsius and relative humidity exceeds 80% in a 24-hour period, there remains the possibility to grow dust mites in the environment. The risk gets high if it lasts longer for the week. To confirm the presence of dust mites, we have to consider both temperature and humidity simultaneously. We have to monitor these parameters for at least 24 hours period. Remember, it is not a direct evidence of the presence of dust mites, but it is a possible indication of emergency situation for the asthmatics as, as, as dust mites grow in this sort of environmental situation most. The second way is monitoring the bad air quality. It can be decided by measuring the dust density in an environment. If the average dust density in a 24 hour period exceeds 32 microgram per meter, uh, per meter cube, there grows an emergency for CRD patients. It is a pretty straightforward measurement that provides us dust density in an environment. We all know that the presence of dust in, an, in the air is a direct addition to the asthmatic reactions. We combined both of the ways to decide the allergic situation for the asthma patients. We had to use few hardware components. They are listed below. I'm not going to explain this in detail. You will find all the technical details in our paper, but I'm going to explain the hardware setup via a block diagram. It is a block diagram of the hardware setup. We have used an Arduino MTR1000 Wi-Fi to connect the sensors. We used DHT22 sensor to measure the environmental temperature and humidity. GP2Y1010 AU0 sensor to measure the dust density in a particular environment. We have also used a, an, an, an LCD panel to show the sensor reading to the user. All these components connect to the Arduino board by following the given diagram. To connect system to the cloud, we have used Arduino IoT Cloud. The sensor readings go to the cloud by using Arduino's Wi-Fi functionality. You will find all the technical details along with the pseudocode in our paper. To experiment with the system, we created the prototype. It, it looks like this. And the output to the LCD and Arduino IoT Cloud looks like this and this. If the certain parameter of the sensor reading exceeds, an alert will be shown in the display. We want to work on with the project to take it to the next step. We want to create a data set by collecting sensor reading and develop a robust machine learning model to early predict the alerting system. This will make our next advanced version of the system. So here goes the reference we used to the complete, uh, complete the project. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the nice presentation.
there is a really such a nice presentation on the air quality monitoring system for the patient thank you they really helpful for the also in society hopefully hopefully thank you yes sir thank you uh, so our next presenter is voice control sorry our next presenter is mutasim billa and the title is voice controlled home automation with cloud based environment monitoring system well thank you so much ms gohel am i audible yes sir thank you so much so i'm sharing my screen first hmm. okay, can you see my slide yes sir sir it is visible okay so a very good evening to all the panel members guests invitees and organizers of today's conference myself mohammad mutasim billa abu numan akant my fellow co-authors include md shyam pradhan sarpina sarwar ulanang shumujunda ratul and mr bijan paul our paper title is voice control home automation with cloud based environment monitoring system which has been supervised by mr bijan paul senior lecturer of the department of computer science and engineering at the university of liberal arts bangladesh well here is our table of contents which will be delivered through the presentation there are some factors that highly motivated us to work on this particular problem first of all we are currently living in the era of the fourth industrial revolution that demands the upgrade of safety measures along with the ease of automated applications secondly an average of 358500 homes experience a structural fire each year which is a very large number right number 3 The National Earthquake Information Center now locates about 20,000 earthquakes around the globe each year or approximately 55 per day. Thirdly, the aged and physically challenged people need easier control of their home appliances and finally, since remote management has led some automation to be a promising area, we have enough scope to develop a more robust and reliable solution for home automation. So our objective is to develop a cloud based solution for home automation that can control household appliances remotely in an efficient way consolidate the safety measures regarding earthquake and fire hazards and monitor the environment continuously for safety concerns we have reviewed almost 20 papers regarding home automation and found out that some of the authors have worked on controlling home appliances with only gas leakage detection using arduino Some of them have worked on controlling home appliances with temperature and humidity detection and others have worked on the same domain with earthquake and fire detection additional but there was no one stop solution where consumers can get all these features all together so coming to the next slide the main two differentiators between all the previous authors and us are nobody integrated the cloud based environment monitoring fire and earthquake detection all together in home automation and nobody combined both arduino and node mcu to increase the system efficiency moving forward to the methodology part we have used both the node mcu and the arduino uno microcontroller concurrently we have implemented the temperature and humidity sensor on the node mcu which collects data on a real time basis and stores it in the cloud The flame sensor and the accelerometer sensor have been implemented on the Arduino Uno microcontroller and finally the home appliances are con connected by a four channel relay module which also can be controlled through voice command using the Google Assistant API. Coming to the working procedure, a user can check which of the electrical devices in a house is switched on or off with the help of a third party app. The household appliances can be switched on or off accordingly from the app either manually or through voice commands. two different graphs can be seen on the current temperature and humidity from the cloud platform and the arduino uno has a flame sensor and an accelerometer sensor connected which can be used to detect fire and earthquake respectively well here is the block diagram of our home automation system starting from the right the flame and the accelerometer sensor are added to the arduino and the dht11 relates to the node mcu the node mcu also utilizes the relay module to control the appliances Here is the system architecture where the sub components with the arrows denote their working mechanism for the home automation system and the overall figure briefly explains how the system works. Here is the circuit diagram that demonstrates the relay module has two different electric connections. Firstly, the AC signal which is for the bulbs and the socket. Secondly, an external connections. Firstly, the AC signal which is for the bulbs and socket. The breadboard helps in the connection of the other components and finally assembles the two different microprocessors arduino and node mcu together and works as one inter system 
Moving forward, the results, here is the overall system where the laptop on the right side is used to provide power to the DC motor, which is used as a fan in the system. The laptop on the left side is used to display graphs on the temperature and humidity collected from the node MC. The main signal from the plug is divided into four different wires that connect to the four input points of the dealer room radio module, where the signal is shared apart from the fan. The fan uses a DC power backup, as mentioned earlier. The temperature and humidity are constantly in check with a 15 second interval, creating two different dynamic graphs and the data is stored for future implementation in the system, which will be discussed in the future work section of this presentation. As we mentioned before, here you can see that the accelerometer sensor has three coordinates and any seismic activity would cause a change in the coordinates, noting that an earthquake has occurred if the PD fan threshold value is exceeded. For the input, the users can use an app that is utilized by the ESP82006 for the dealer module and control the electric components connected to the smart home, which is demonstrated in figure eight. Along with that, the users can also use their voice commands through Google Assistant API to control the switches accordingly. Figure nine is the complete hardware implementation for our solution. As we mentioned earlier that we are storing the sensor data in the cloud. So our future works include developing a machine learning model along with other sensors on the cloud stored data, adding more sensors, for example, pressure sensor to monitor and predict weather more accurately, developing an AI-based automated recommendation system with a voice speaker feature to suggest clothes or apparel based on the weather, installing IR sensors to turn on and off appliances automatically based on human detection. Well, here are the references of all the information we have used to develop this one-stop solution till now. So that was all from our side. We'll be glad to answer any questions if you have regarding our today's presentation. Okay. Nice presentation. I have one question, sir. Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, I want, I want to know how to detect your earthquake or which parameter you consider in your hardware. Okay, so as we have implemented the accelerometer sensor, we have defined in our programming on Arduino that if any motion activity exceeds the threshold value of 3.5 in Richter scale, then it will record it as an earthquake minor. And if it exceeds Richter scale seven, then it will be recorded as a major earthquake. I hope oh. I can give your answer. Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. There is, a, uh, there is a mention in the Arduino program, right? Right, yeah, right, right, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and cooperation. Thank you. Yeah. So, with the next presenter is Anushka, and the present paper title is Mazur Khata, a mobile application for daily wage labor management. Uh, yes. I'm here, so I shall present my screen. Is the screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, so hello, everyone. I'm Anushka Mutkhedkar, and I'm presenting my paper on Mazur Katta, a mobile application for daily wage labor management. The co authors for this project are Assistant Professor Rakhi Bharadwa, Amuk Dikshit, Ayush Inge, and Fatima Khatan. So, the presentation outline is the problem statement introduction, review of the existing system, the basic workflow, system architecture, database model and methodology, followed by user interface, conclusion and references. So the problem statement. In today's world, there is a severe crisis of employment opportunities in local labor, ma labor markets. So daily wage laborers often travel from nearby towns or villages for daily work, but they don't have a job security. So they might come to the town but uh, many times they don't get hired and they struggle to make ends meet. So what is daily wage work? It is where a worker is hired and paid one day at a time with no promise that the work will be available in future. So uh, many times you see in the city, there are places like Mazur Mandi or labor market where the employers visit uh, and hire a few people according to their needs. Uh, so before COVID, the earnings of the daily wage workers were 10,000 per month and the average almost dropped to 6,000 per month after COVID, which is why a system 
or a mobile application to help these daily wage workers in securing proper jobs and also guaranteeing a pay at the end of the day is extremely essential, uh, which is why we have uh, provided a easy access uh, to such a application where the a worker could find jobs and the employer would also be able to post their jobs. So for the development of the application, we have used Flutter for the front-end development and Firebase along with Cloud Firestore for the back-end development. So review of the existing system. Right now, there exists three systems, that is the WorkSap, MyRoseBar, and Labor Adda, which provide such services. But Across all these three, we have observed that these uh, these apps are only employer centered. So many of the uh, many of the time, the employers uh, post their job on the on the website on the application or the website, and also uh, the post creators, that is the employers, can track the statistics of such posts. And uh, there is most of the times a third party or an organization which hires daily wage workers at the belt and they access this website to send them to uh, such employers places. Uh, but the different thing about labor at the was that it used GPS to track the job and find the nearest app certified worker. And then that worker is sent to the work site. So looking at this, we uh, added a few features to our uh, application. The first one was the category filter. So what it does is that the uh, worker would be able to enter the skill or their uh, past jobs which they have done, jobs which they are familiar with. For example, if a person is uh, experienced with construction type of jobs, then uh, most, the, most of the job descriptions they would find or the job openings they would find would be for those types of works like construction or any labor work. But they, uh, it won't be for uh, work such as cleaning some place or cooking anything. So uh, it will be according to the skill of the worker. So the base, this is the basic workflow of our application. So the user will be of two types, as I uh, said, the employer and the worker or the laborer. So employer would be able to create a new job opening and the worker would be able to apply to that. And also uh, we have implemented a feature for uh, multilingual support using the Google Translate API uh, to make it easier for many people from rural, rural areas to also be able to access this application with ease. So this is the system architecture. The presentation layer of our application consists of the UI and the views for the user. The business layer contains the sign-in and the authentication processes with computational functions uh, like uh, finding the job data, the worker data, which is fetched from the uh, database, that is the data layer, Firebase, and Cloud Firestore. So uh, we basically have three data collections in there, workers, which contains all the worker details, employers, which contains details for the employers, and also contain the jobs for, uh, which have been uh, posted by those employers. And, and why have we kept jobs in those and not a separate collection? It is because that uh, we have also implemented a feature that when, you, uh, when a worker clicks on the apply or applies for a certain job, the workers who have applied for that job would also be visible in the employer section, which is why it was important to create the job uh, job collection or the job details sub collection in the employer's uh, data, and also the job data which is used for uh, used for containing the keywords that is the requirement for the job, and also reference to the employer database. So, uh, as we have two modules which cater to the employer and the worker, we have the following functions which uh, create the basic working of the app. So the first is the job creation, which is for the employer. As it states, it creates the jobs. Then the view workers, to view the workers who are applied to the job. For, uh, this feature is also for the employer. Then is the category filter, which fetches open job list according to the worker skill and the job requirements, for which we have utilized the matching algorithm. Uh, then is the view job details page, where all the job details present in the employer's database are uh, displayed in a proper structured format for the worker to see and also the view jobs where the employer who has posted the jobs can view all their previous jobs or the worker can also view the previous jobs they have done or they have applied to and also the apply functionality uh, functionality for the specific job uh, this uh, is for the worker and when they click on the apply the worker id is appended to the list present in the job database 
so this is the basic user interface theme so this is the login page along uh, and the second image which is uh, of the main page for the employer so first it shows uh, jobs in a tab view and the history that is the previous jobs uh, then second is uh, the third image is that of the uh, view job details for the worker and also the fourth image is for creating new jobs for the employer so in conclusion right now our app provides all the basic functionalities that required uh, for such a system and uh, it can further be enhanced by applying a distance filter using the google maps api along with the polyline coordinates feature to, uh, for helping the workers in finding the job near their local uh, locality so like uh, they can uh, enter a distance 5 km and all the jobs between the 5 km radius of that person would be displayed to them uh, the payment gateway is under development which would help in securing the transactions between the worker and the user for which we are utilizing the Razor Pay API. Uh, these are the references for our pay, uh, for our application. Uh, thank you. Now uh, I would be open to any questions you ask. Yes, Anushka. I have a question. But... Yes. Um... Have you any faced any issue in your system that can be said limitation of your proposed system? Uh, actually, the first, uh, uh, the most difficult situation we could face is that uh, now that we have seen the statistics that most of the people uh, they have a smartphone, but uh, many of them still don't. Like uh, ten percent of the pop rural population does not uh, have an access to a smartphone. Uh, which is why for that we are trying to implement a certain way in which multiple workers or multiple users can be logged in at the same time in a single uh, on a single device, which would make it easier. Okay, that is your future work, right? Multiple. Workers, yes, multiple, multiple logins on a single device at a single instance of time. Okay, okay, that is a future work, right? Uh, yes, it's under development. Mm. Okay, okay, that. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. <clears throat>
thank you thank you miss goel thank you so much okay but really nice presentation of the all presented it would really helpful to society hopefully yeah so let's okay okay thank you so much best of luck for the future work stay safe take care take care miss goel yeah thank you